Kia ora kato. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming along to our lecture on capital gains, which has turned out to be quite the topical issue. It wasn't quite the topical issue that we um, thought it would be when we planned this lecture, so it's great timing from our perspective. So I'm Lisa Marriott, and I'm here today with Max Rashbrook. We are both from the Victoria Business School. Max is with the Institute for Governance and uh, Policy Studies and I am in the School of Accounting and Commercial Law. So what we are going to do today is I am going to start with a brief fairly brief, maybe five minute talk to you on what a capital gains tax is and then Max will talk to you a wee bit about why we might want or even possibly need a capital gains tax and then I will come back and I'll talk to you about the different components of what a capital gains tax might look like because there are all sorts of different ways that you can have a capital gains tax, lots of different things you can include and, and exclude and so on. So we'll have a bit of a talk about about the policy design options there. So, but before we go on, let's just have a bit of a talk about what is a capital and actually also importantly, what is income. Now, for tax purposes, this is a really important distinction. Now, when we are teaching our students initially about this whole idea of capital versus income, we use this analogy of a tree, a tree and fruit. And what we do is for our students, we say, look, you know, from a tax perspective, you can think of the capital component as being the tree and the income component as being the fruit on the tree. Now, in New Zealand, we tax the fruit, we tax the income, but we don't comprehensively tax that asset. Now, that asset, in this case the tree, is when the taxable uh, uh, transaction would occur when that item is sold. So I've put a couple of examples up here about that well, we call it the capital revenue distinction, but it's capital versus income is possibly a clearer way of looking at it. So in New Zealand, chances are the two things which would be impacted most from a capital gains tax would be shares and real property. So the shares themselves are the capital asset. At the moment, we do tax the income from that asset. So that is in the form of dividends. We'll park imputation credit for a moment, but in theory at least those dividends are fully taxed. Now the same thing happens with the rental property. So the rental property or an investment property, that is the capital asset, but the income stream from that capital asset is taxed. So that's in the form of rents. Now in New Zealand we tax income very well. So if you've got interest you'll be taxed on, on, on that as a form of income, wages, salaries, all other types of income we generally tend to tax quite comprehensively. So on my slide here, we've, there's, there's really three ways in which we can tax. One is income, one is consumption, one is capital. We tax income pretty comprehensively in New Zealand. We tax consumption. This is basically purchases, purchasing goods and services. We tax that even more comprehensively. Pretty much everything is subject to a consumption tax in New Zealand. So that's our GST, our goods and services tax. There's very few exceptions. Exclusions. However, what we don't do is we don't comprehensively tax capital gains. So what happens in most countries is you start with a general capital gains tax and then you exclude items that you don't want to come under that capital gains tax. But you usually start from the position that everything or the capital gains are subject to tax with specific exclusions. Now we do the opposite in New Zealand. We basically don't tax capital gains unless they are specifically 
included. And we do have some things that are included. So, for example, the new bright line test, you know, that test that we have, uh, the, the, the tax that we have now, if you buy and sell a property within two years, if it's not your principal family residence, then that will be subject to tax. So that is a capital gains tax. There are other parts of the Income Tax Act that also do tax capital gains, but it works that unless it is specifically included, then it won't be subject to a capital gains tax. So it's, it's not correct to say necessarily that we don't tax capital gains, but it is correct to say that we don't tax the majority of capital gains. So that is just by way of introduction. I'm going to hand over to Max now, and Max will talk you through this um, about why we might want or need a capital gains Kia ora koutou. Thanks very much for that, Lisa. Um, yeah, I should stress that um, I'm here today not at all as a tax expert, um, but as someone with a research background in inequality, um, income and wealth inequality. So I'll be talking um, out of that perspective. Um, I mean, obviously, when you're, you're thinking about tax, there's a number of purposes that it serves. Um, one is the simple question of how do you fund all the services that government needs to provide um, and what are the resources that are available uh, to be taxed um, in that sense. Um, you also have the question of redistribution um, coming out of the view that uh, you know, some of what people have is down to their own hard work um, and investment in their own education and so on and so forth, but of course a lot of it is down to luck and other social factors, um, it's down to the kind of supports that people are provided by communally provided infrastructure. And so in both those cases you look at, well, you know, where are the resources available, you know, for taxation? Is there a need for redistribution? You know, is there a significant uh, level of inequality that exists such that you might correct it for those moral reasons that I've already mentioned um, and also because there is I think a strong evidence-based view that very high levels of inequality uh, have negative effects um, on society as a whole in the sense of making societies more divided, less cohesive, um, less trustful in increasing the chances that certain people will have greater influence over politics than others having effects on opportunity, intergenerational transmission of advantage, all these kinds of reasons. Um, so it's important to think you know, from a tax and from a fairness um, and from a practical point of view, you know, where are resources distributed? And as Lisa said, you know, we already do that fairly comprehensively in regards of income, looking at where the income is distributed, what's available to be taxed, um, making the, you know, affecting redistribution through the income tax system, but we don't do that in any comprehensive way around wealth. Um, and that is potentially a reason for concern when you consider the levels of wealth inequality um, in New Zealand. When you look at household wealth, um, there is uh, a bit over a trillion dollars of household wealth in New Zealand, um, and that's net wealth, so that's the assets that people own um, once you subtract their liabilities, their debts. Um, and when you look at that uh, data, you see that, as it says on the slide, the wealthiest tenth of New Zealanders own 60% of all the wealth. Um, within that, the wealthiest 1% of New Zealanders own about, I think, 22% of all the wealth. Um, in contrast, and then after that, 60% of the wealthiest tenth have the next chunk of the population, so the rest of the middle class, as it were, um, have about 35%. Um, but that leaves the poorest half of the country with less than 5% uh, of all net wealth. So that's a reasonably high level of wealth inequality. It's higher than um, the inequality of income. You know, wealth is much less equally distributed than income is. Um, and it's high by international standards as well. Um, some data that Brian Perry from MSD provided on um, wealth concentration in a number of developed countries. Now, a lot of these figures are from the mid-2000s, so they may be slightly out of date. It showed that when you look at that share of wealth held by the top 10%, um, which, as I've said, in New Zealand is 60%, uh, in Italy it's 
the UK 45%, uh, Finland 45%, Canada 53%, Germany 55%. Um, so we actually have relatively high inequality uh, compared to other, some other developed countries. I mean, admittedly, the US at 71%, so we're not as unequal as the US. Um, but especially for a country that traditionally thinks of itself as egalitarian, um, we have quite a significant inequality of wealth. Um, now, obviously, uh, you have to think about well, what is that wealth made up of, um, and it depends a little bit um, how you ask the question, and different surveys give slightly different answers, but roughly 40% um, of housing, uh, roughly 40% of household wealth um, is tied up in housing. Um, and that's probably a bit higher if you include all the forms of investment, property, and so on and so forth that people have. Um, now, sort of taxes on wealth and various kinds of capital gains tax among them are sometimes, you know, argued as being an important tool to uh, deal with our, you know, uh, rapidly expanding housing market and the housing bubble we're in. Um, now, this isn't my sphere of expertise particularly. Um, I would assume that, I mean, if you're going to have a capital gains tax that's reasonably comprehensive, it would also hit um, other forms of capital gains that people would make through selling shares and businesses. And so it wouldn't exactly rebalance all the incentives away from investing in housing, but simply by taxing the gains people make from selling houses, it presumably would have some effect on the housing market um, alongside other measures to increase supply, clamp down on excessive lending, and so on and so forth. Um, but I do think, you know, if you step back from that for a moment, um, the point that housing is 40% of all wealth does tell, and the vast majority of that is owner-occupied um, housing wealth, you do, you are going to have to think very strongly about housing um, and the taxation of the family home if you're going to talk about um, any kind of wealth tax. Now, as Lisa will talk about later on, you know, there's, all, there's various, ways, various exemptions you can have not taxing things up to a certain point, um, and I think that's very important. And, of course, there are different kinds of wealth taxes uh, on offer, and particularly if you're concerned about inequality. Uh, Gareth Morgan has a sort of comprehensive capital income tax, which aims to capture all the benefits people get from holding wealth. Uh, Thomas Piketty, the French economist, also suggests a progressive tax on wealth um, levied annually so that as your fortune gets larger, you pay a greater share of its value every year and that has a very strong inequality reducing effect. Um, but there's all, all sorts of, sort of technical challenges about how you do that or how you do a capital gains tax. Uh, and on that note, I'll hand back over to Lisa. So, now, as I said right at the start, you know, this has become quite an election issue. So, let me take you back to this time six years ago, which was when this actually was a pretty big issue again. And when Labour proposed the capital gains tax, not last election, but the election before, this was what was said at the time. So uh, John Key, as Prime Minister, said any capital gains tax would have to apply to all houses, including the family home, if it was to work properly. Now, this was really pretty unfortunate because it did sort of shut down the debate and the discussion and, to my mind at least, it stopped us having a really informed discussion of what a capital gains tax could be. Now, this um, could be taken from the Donald Trump school of um, policy, but you know, there's very, very little truth in this statement. Most countries don't include the family home. And there's really good policy reasons why you don't want to include your principal family home in a capital gains tax. We know that people have better standards of living if they live in their own home. We know when it comes to retirement that people retire into a much better financial space if they have their own family home. And really, you don't want to do anything from a policy perspective that is going to impact on that as an outcome. There's only one country that I know of that it includes the principal family home, and I'll talk to you about that country in a, a few slides. Uh, and there's a very good policy reason why they do that. So, look, the general principle is your principal family home is never included in your capital gains tax. And there's been nothing to suggest that it would be in New Zealand from any of the, the commentary that I have seen. 
So you know, what is included? What is normally excluded? Um, in New Zealand, probably the biggest impact would be on um, investment properties and other types of perhaps, you know, commercial properties. Uh, what is normally, ex and, and shares I should say as well, but what's normally excluded is all your standard types of personal assets. So vehicles, antiques, jewellery, family home, stamp collection, you know, all the sorts of things that you might have. Now, there's a good reason actually, in fact, why you might want some of these things to not be included in a capital gains tax and that is the reality is most of our personal assets actually decline in value. Right? So capital losses are a part of this equation. So to the extent that we are taxing capital gains, the tax system usually has a symmetry of treatment. So to the extent we've got a capital gains tax, we also have to address capital losses. Okay. Now, I'll come on to that in just a second, but the reason why most of your personal assets are usually excluded from a capital gains tax is because, in fact, you're never likely to make a gain on them, and what we don't want is we don't want lots of people making capital losses, which then can be used to um, potentially either reduce your capital gains you pay or reduce your other income. So that's actually the real reason why most of your personal assets are excluded. Now, within personal assets, the things like you know your super yachts, it depends a little bit on the country. So some countries have a, um, a certain amount of large type of assets that you can have uh, while still being um, excluded from capital gains tax. Other countries uh, will include things like personal aircraft and so on. So you know, that's just a policy design issue. Um, now, in so far as who pays a capital gains tax, a capital gains tax is subject to uh, payment by individuals and companies as well. So it isn't just individuals that pay capital gains, it is also entities. So any entity or individual making a capital gains is potentially uh, open to paying capital gains tax. Now, what happens with capital losses? So we make a capital gain when we sell something for more than what we paid for it. We make a capital loss in the other situation, which is where we sell something for less than what we paid. So in the examples that I've got here, if we um, sell an asset for $50,000, we paid $15,000 for it, we have a gain of $35,000. It is the gain that's taxable. So it's not all the proceeds from the sale, it's just the gain component that's taxable. Now, if we have a capital loss, so in this case we get $10,000 for selling our asset, we paid $15,000 for it, we've got a capital loss of $5,000. Now, usually what happens with capital losses is they're not usually able to be used to offset other income tax payable. So usually what they're used for is to offset capital gains. So to the extent that you have a capital gain, and a capital loss, they offset each other and capital losses reduce the amount of capital gains tax that you would pay. So in this example here, you've got a gain of 35,000, a loss of 5,000, that would mean that you would have a taxable gain of 30,000. Now, what I'm going to talk to you about for the remainder of this discussion is the various sorts of things that we need to know about if we're going to have an informed discussion on capital gains taxes. So, let's start with the rate of tax. Now, there is no one right, one right rate of tax for capital gains. Different countries do different things. So, to a certain extent, there's some logic attached, attached to having the capital gains tax rate at the same as the income tax rate of the taxpayer. So in New Zealand, uh, the highest income tax rate is 33%, and a lot of countries have their capital gains tax rate as the same rate as, the, as your marginal income tax rate. Some countries discount that, so you might get a 50% discount in some cases. Some countries actually, where they really do want to tax wealth, will have the rate higher. 
than the, than the income tax rate of the taxpayer. So there's no one right way of, doing, of, of deciding on the rate of tax. Now, the annual exclusion. Most countries have an annual amount that people can get in capital gains before they start having to pay the tax. Now, this is very sensible, really sensible from a compliance cost perspective. You know, you don't want to be trying to collect, you know, capital gains on somebody who's made a $1,000 gain in that particular year. So usually most countries have a small amount, and by small amount I'm meaning maybe 2,000, 5,000 of, of capital gains that you can make in any year before you become subject to capital gains. And that's sensible for, for a whole bunch of reasons. Usually most countries also allow that to accumulate. So if you don't use your, con your concession this year, you can accumulate it over you know, 10 years and then offset that when you do happen to make a capital gain. Now, the other thing that I've got on here is realisation or accrual. Now, I'm just going to mention this because, again, this is something that comes up again uh, sometimes when capital gains taxes are raised. Now, capital gains taxes are almost always realisation based. Now, by realisation I mean that the tax becomes payable when the asset is sold. And again, lots of sensible reasons why you might want to do that, uh, and it's because usually at that point at least you know the person has the cash to pay the tax. The other option is this accrual option, which means that people pay the tax year on year as those gains accrue, even if they haven't actually sold the asset. Now, theoretically, that's a very pure way of doing it. Uh, however, it does have an impact on cash flow. So this is why generally capital gains taxes tend to be realisation based. So it's when that asset is sold. Okay. Here are some other things we need to think about. So these are other things we need to consider when we're talking about capital gains. Now, we do have something which is called a lock-in effect. Now, uh, the theory is a bit undecided as to the extent to which this actually exists, but there is the potential for people to not sell assets or to delay selling assets because the taxable event will happen when that asset is sold. So theoretically, people might hold on to assets for longer than what they otherwise might, to delay that taxable event occurring. We have something else which they claim to see in Australia called the mansion effect. Now, this is people over-investing in their family home because their family home is not subject to capital gains tax. Now, this is rational only up to a point. There becomes a point where this becomes a very irrational decision to make. However, there is, you know, if some people will over-invest in their family home in order to avoid capital gains tax. Now, there's plenty of other issues relating to what is the primary family home. So how do you stop, for example, a family of four having, um, you know, mum owning one house, dad owning another, and a child owning another house, and a child, another child having another house? And that's really just something which comes um, down to having appropriate sort of anti-avoidance measures in place to make sure that really people are residing in properties if they are, if that is going to be classified as their principal family residence. Um, but it is always a discussion point that comes up, but it is one that can be dealt with. Yeah. Now, you do see usually concessions in relation to capital gains tax. So one of the concessions is usually in relation to people who have a small business. They might have had that small business all their life, and they'll sell that business when it comes to retirement. So most countries allow a small business, and by a small small business, I'm not meaning trade me sort of business here, small business on retirement, usually people are allowed some tax-free con concessions for capital gains tax at that point. And that's actually just to recognise that usually if you've got a small business, you've probably invested a lot more in that small business uh, than people might have, have done otherwise, perhaps into more traditional types of retirement savings. Okay. So again, tr you know, it's all about trying to be fair.
Now, from a compliance cost perspective, you do need a valuation date with a capital gains tax. So that's a date from which your capital gains tax starts. So if we think about the two main types of things that would be caught here with the, in New Zealand with a capital gains tax, you've got shares. Now, that's probably not too problematic with your valuation date. That have a market value on a certain date, so that would be okay. Uh, the issue may be around property. You'd have to make sure that your properties were all valued um, in a fair way at the time the capital gains tax was to start, because it would be gains from that particular value at a specific date that would be taxable. Uh, and I guess the other thing to say with a compliance cost is that capital gains would require people to file tax returns. Whereas, of course, a lot of people in New Zealand don't have to file tax returns. So, but having said that, again, it's likely to only impact on a relatively small part of the population because people who have the types of investment properties that we'd be talking about here as being caught under this tax, uh, they'd be filing tax returns anyway because they'd be having to account for the income streams from those properties so it would probably be only people who perhaps are selling shares and making gains above a, a certain threshold. Now, I've picked four countries here that I wanted to talk to you about what they do from their capital gains tax. Now, I'm not going to talk about all components of their tax regime. I just wanted to pull out a few components. Now, I did actually, I did choose these countries um, because they have different components in their capital gains tax, but I also noticed that they coincidentally happen to be countries that we've all had good rugby games with in recent times. So, uh, but <coughs> parking that. South Africa. Now, South Africa is the country that I mentioned to you includes the principal family home. So their principal family residence is included in their capital gains tax but only gains above $210,000. Now, $210,000 is probably not actually going to give you anything in, in um, Wellington. However, I went online to see what I could get for this equivalent in um, South Africa, and it turns out that you get quite a nice property in um, one of the central cities, uh, a very big house uh, with a swimming pool, big section, plus a couple of other um, sort of self-contained units on that property, one presumes for your domestic help, uh, and you would get that for this sort of price in South Africa. So just for context, they are including the principal family home, but it is at a, a very generous level. It's only when we're co I'm converting it back into New Zealand dollars here that it looks like it's relatively modest. Uh, my guess would be that you'd be looking at a home, an equivalent home of probably at least $2 million in Wellington before you'd be starting to look at, at tax. So they're quite unusual in doing that. The other thing that I would say with South Africa is, you know, Max has talked to you about inequality. Inequality is, is, is considerably even more extreme in South Africa. So the capital gains tax is very much targeted as a wealth tax. Most people in South Africa don't even pay any income tax. That's how widespread the inequality is. So the taxes in South Africa are quite different from what we would see in New Zealand. Now, they do have an annual allowance that converts to just over 4,000 New Zealand dollars. So that's the amount of capital gains that you can have before you have to start paying capital gains tax. And that is at a rate of 40%. So all capital gains are taxed at 40%. The top income tax rate for context is 41%. Now, so that's all I'll say about South Africa. Now, Ireland, Ireland also have an annual allowance. Their annual allowance is, uh, converts in euros back to New Zealand dollars to be about 2,000 New Zealand dollars. Capital gains are taxed at 33%. Now, that is quite a concession in Ireland. Ireland's top income tax rate, well, actually, at the moment, it's 41%. But they have another couple of social insurances on top of that, which means that in, in practice, their t top income tax rate is 52%. So this is actually quite a concessional rate here for capital gains. Okay. Family homes excluded, uh, which is what you'd expect, and they do have a concessional rate here as well for the sale of a business up to a million euros. And again, that tends to be pretty common amongst capital gains taxes.
Now, the UK, um, the UK have a very generous annual allowance. It's $20,000. So you can have $20,000 in capital gains in the UK before you come under the capital gains tax regime. Top marginal tax rates, 28%. That is what you would pay your capital gains tax at. Now, here's a policy that some of our politicians would like. The family home is excluded, but only if you are a resident. If you are not a resident, your family home is included in capital gains tax, even if it is clearly your principal family home. So um, residents only get that concession of the family home. Now, Australia, Australia, the rate is the same as your income tax rate. So maximum there in Australia at the moment is 45%, but Australia have a lot of concessions, a lot of concessions. Um, I've put here they have a 50% discount for assets held for more than 12 months. Again, this is only if you're a resident. So if you're a non-resident, you don't get that discount for capital gains tax. And they have a number of other concessions as well. So the Australian model for capital gains tax is really quite complex. Now, the question, of course, is how much revenue will it raise? And I don't, I'm not even going to try and, and offer any sort of solution there because it depends very much on the policy settings. So to the extent that you perhaps have a low uh, threshold, obviously your capital gains tax will collect more. And the other thing with the capital gains tax is it takes a while to mature. So what you'll find with the capital gains tax is that it will collect, or the amount that it will collect, will uh, steadily increase over the time that it's been in existence. Now, just to give you some indication, in Australia, believe it or not, their capital gain that they at least in theory, could have collected in 2014-15 uh, was $106 billion. Now, just for context, that's about 1.5 times our entire tax collection in New Zealand. Now, of course, they didn't actually collect anything like this. Now, the reason why they didn't is because there's a number of things that then go to reduce this figure. So, for example, in that one year, there were uh, capital losses of $28 billion. Uh, so that's capital losses in that year. There's prior year capital losses, which also offset that. In Australia, there's uh, people still carrying forward losses from the, the global financial crisis. So those capital losses do remain in the system for a long time. There's uh, just one of the capital gains discounts reduced uh, yeah, reduce that figure by $21 billion. And there are a whole bunch of other concessions as well, which do reduce that amount collected in Australia. However, it's not to say it, it's still collecting a reasonable sum of money. Now, another one just for context is the UK. The UK capital gains tax collects around about 1% of total tax revenue, which is fairly low, but they have one of the most generous exemption amounts there. So remember, they have that uh, 20000 in New Zealand dollars a year that uh, you can gain capital gains before you have to start paying the tax. So that's really quite high. Now, in the UK, only a very small proportion of the population actually pay capital gains tax. So 200,000 people, so 0.3% of the population are actually paying capital gains tax. It's intended to be a wealth tax, so it is really targeted at the very uh, top, um, the, well, the people with the highest levels of wealth. Okay. Now, because we're talking about capital gains tax, it seemed a good time to just sort of say, well, look, you know, are there other options? And yes, there are other options. Historically, we've had all these options in New Zealand. We've had gift duties, we've had estate duties, we've had land taxes. They've all been implemented, they've all been repealed. Uh, now, usually, in fact, most of these have been repealed in, you know, in times that we would remember. So 
they have had issues with avoidance and when they've been repealed, particularly in relation to gift duties and estate duties, some of the main reasons given for their repeal is that they're not collecting much tax, which was absolutely fair, and there were significant anti-avoidance measures in place uh, to avoid these taxes, which is also fair. But on the other side, there is really no political will to try to address any of the avoidance measures that were going on that could have happened. So we don't have any other taxes which are really the traditional forms of wealth taxes. And pretty much every other country has some form of capital gains tax and they may have another form of wealth tax as well, so a gift duty, a state duty or a land tax. Now, Tax Working Group back on the agenda, of course, as well, potentially at the moment. It's been talked about in recent weeks. We did have a tax working group in around about 2010. Now, one of the things that tax working group said, and it did have some very good uh, tax advisors, tax prof professionals on that tax working group, one of the things they uh, did recommend was more coherent taxation of the gains on capital or possibly a land tax. So that came out of the last tax working group during this, this current government. Now, it was disregarded. Obviously, we don't have any of these things. But the figures that were put attached to the land tax was that it would collect 2.3 billion, which is a reasonably significant sum of money, if the land tax was at half a percent. Okay. Now, to give you some idea of what that would mean in practice, it's if you had a house which is uh, 500000 so half a million dollars, it would mean you'd be paying a land tax of about $2,500 a year. Now, the thing with a land tax is you can't target a land tax in the same way that a capital gains tax is effectively more targeted towards the wealthy. So a land tax would need to be paid by anybody who owns land. So a land tax would really have to include a family home as well. Um, so look, just to conclude, uh, one of my colleagues wrote this and I quite liked it so I stole it for today. Wealth taxes have impeccable equity credentials and raise few plausible counter grounds. The reality is the people that would pay a capital gains tax are the wealthy. Our current approach is a pretty significant concession to the wealthy. It's possible to make some pretty big gains in New Zealand and not have those gains taxed. And then those gains, because we don't have any sort of inheritance or estate tax, taxes, they flow through generations and they don't do anything to address the inequality issues that, that Max has raised. Um, the last tax working group did talk about a number of um, benefits of these types of taxes and particularly in relation to a capital gains tax, they talked about it broadening the tax base, improving integrity and efficiency, improving equity and fairness and providing a more sustainable tax revenue base. So all those things are very much desirable from a, a tax perspective um, and from a fairness perspective and from an inequality perspective. Perspective. So I will leave you there, I'll leave you with this last slide in case you can't read this little comment here. It says, when the land tax came in, we restructured. Thank you all very much.